Today is January 21st, 2014. Welcome to episode 77 of Let's Talk Bitcoin, a twice weekly show about the ideas, people, and projects building the digital economy and the future of money. Visit us at letstalkbitcoin.com for our daily guest blog, all our past episodes, and of course, tipping addresses. My name is Adam B. Levine, and today is special. Adam Back is a British cryptographer and crypto hacker. He's the inventor of Hashcash, the proof-of-work system used by Bitcoin. And after we were initially introduced by mutual acquaintance Charles Hoskinson, I met Adam at the Vegas conference, surrounded by a large huddle of attendees listening to him speak in the hall. Adam very rarely does interviews, and so when he agreed without too much reticence, I was pretty thrilled. I'm a pretty sharp guy, but I know my strengths and organized what I hoped would be a half-hour interview between he and Andreas M. Antonopoulos the next morning before our brunch meetup. That day we finished brunch and Andreas never showed up. Today I'm pleased to share with you the reasons why. What follows is a very deep, lengthy, and many times highly technical conversation about Bitcoin. It will not be for everybody, but I encourage you to listen to it anyhow because it's an important conversation, and osmosis is sometimes just as good as understanding. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome. This is Andreas Antonopoulos from Let's Talk Bitcoin here in Las Vegas for the Inside Bitcoins conference. It's a great pleasure today to have Adam Back, applied cryptographer and somewhat of a celebrity in the Bitcoin space because of his long history of contribution to cryptography in general, but essentially some of the building blocks of Bitcoin. Adam, welcome to the show. Hi, good to be with you. So, Adam, can you tell us a bit about your history in the space of applied cryptography? I was interested initially in PGP. When that first came out, I found it very interesting that there were political and balance of power implications between individuals and the state so that people could change. I mean, they could communicate with other people without any possibility for interception. And the ability to communicate privately is essentially a right in many countries. So you can think of it from the point of view that you have some legal rights. You have a right to freedom of association, freedom of speech. But to strongly exercise them, you need to cryptographically enforce them. Privacy technology, end-to-end uh, -end encryption, things like PGP, enable that, enable people to exercise their rights. And the ability to strongly exercise their rights enables people to, to build a democratic society. Uh, I think it's necessary for that. So th tools like encryption also open the possibility for much more creative expression, which uh, nowadays is becoming very difficult. This uh, constant feeling of being surveilled, ubiquitous surveillance is antithetical to democracy. It's antithetical to right. free expression. That's very much true. So I mentioned freedom of expression, but I mean freedom of association. So to get freedom of expression, you maybe need encryption so that you can communicate privately between yourself and your colleagues or friends. But freedom of association actually requires another cryptographic property, which would be anonymous communication. So mm -hmm. if you have a legal right to have freedom of association, and society recognizes this in law, in fact, in most Western countries, then you need anonymity technology. So you need to be able to send emails anonymously. You were involved in uh, many of the early developments in applied cryptography, and you don't just talk about the theory and philosophy of cryptography, but you are involved in innovating in both cryptographic applications, but also cryptographic algorithms. In fact, you're one of the six or seven people cited in the Satoshi Nakamoto paper on Bitcoin as one of the contributors to the state of the art that came before, specifically with Hashcash. As I mentioned, I became interested in PGP and then I subscribed to the Cypherpunks list and bought a number of books on applied cryptography. I was actually doing a PhD in distributed systems at the time, but I kind of uh, didn't make much progress on distributed systems for a couple of years. It was a four-year course and took a big detour into applied cryptography and basically spent all my time learning everything I could about that. I mean, obviously interested in the technical aspects so that, you know, if you know the features available, you can use them as building blocks to achieve new interesting properties or privacy-enhancing technology mm -hmm. systems. So you can look at it from the point of view of requirements. You want certain requirements from the system, so you want to have freedom of association. You need anonymity. Many um, deployed systems have some non-ideal properties because it's quite technically challenging to achieve some of these properties. So in that context, I also became interested in privacy technology, so for example, anonymous remailers, 
For a while, I ran an anonymous remailer, and a problem I observed there firsthand, and obviously other people were experiencing this and concerned about it, was that because it's anonymous, people can create mischief. So I think people are generally happy with the fact that anonymous speech could be unpopular speech. You know, the right to freedom of speech includes speech that you personally find unpleasant or derogatory and what have you. And so people are generally willing to delete or ignore things they're not interested in if they see an anonymous discussion. Discussion on topics on like a public discussion forum with some anonymous contributors. If the anonymous contributors are being disruptive, they'll generally be ignored and people will be happy with that. But there is also the consideration of sort of denial of service amplification. So for example, Usenet is a broadcast mechanism. So mm -hmm. And the anonymous remailer operators wanted to allow people to participate in public discussions anonymously. So there were mail-to-news gateways and direct news posting facilities within the anonymous remailers. And some people, for whatever reason, I mean, it's not clear, obviously, because they were anonymous and they weren't explaining their motivations, would post large amounts of spam, essentially, to Usenet with no particular meaning, just large volumes of random text and what have you, basically to, I mean, you could imagine perhaps to discredit Remailers, that remailers were a source of large volumes of useless junk that was clogging up Usenet. And you know, every message that goes onto Usenet would basically be brought through a broadcast stream mechanism, arrive at millions of computers on the internet, so the overall volume of network resources used was quite large. I was kind of thinking about that problem, and I happened to be reading about birthday collisions in hashes, just as on a technical basis, and it occurred to me that a full birthday collision, let's say uh, on SHA-1 at the time, it takes approximately two to the 80 operations to create, so it's an immense workload to create that collision. But once you have that collision, you'll be able to demonstrate it to somebody and they'll be able to verify it in almost zero time. I mean, in about the same amount of time it will take you to process a TCP packet, I mean, a few thousand cycles on a CPU. I thought, well, that's interesting. There's an ability to prove work there. Maybe I can modify that algorithm so that I can have a scalable proof of work, a proof of work that I can say, force it to take one minute or ten minutes instead of a billion years. And so I set about to changing that algorithm. And now one, one aspect of birthday collisions is to compute them requires large amounts of memory. And there's a time memory trade-off, in fact. And I've, I viewed this as a somewhat an attractive property. So I, I try to avoid that and switch to exploring partial pre-images. Can you explain that a tiny bit, how, what, <laughs> yeah. what birthday collision is and, and what okay. partial pre-image is? So a birthday collision, it refers to the uh, kind of surprising statistical phenomenon that if you go to a party and you wonder what is the probability that there will be two people in the room with the same birth date. Assuming birth dates are evenly distributed throughout the year, surprisingly, and there are 365 days in the year, surprisingly you only need 23 people in the room to have the same birthday. Now, for, for large numbers, you can approximately estimate that if there are a million days in a year, you need about a 1,000 people in the room, so it's approximately the square root. Right. And so when you're talking about cryptographic hardness, you're saying, so SHA-1 has an output of 160, so that's 2 to the 160 work operation to do a full exploration of its key space. Um, that's like a brute force of trying every possible output of SHA-1 to right. produce it. Yeah. So if you're looking for a birthday collision, the way you do that is you compute lots of candidate inputs to SHA-1 and get the outputs, which are essentially random. You store them in a big table, and you keep doing that until you find an output that's the same. So because of the birthday principle that we just described, you would expect to do that in 2 to the 80 operations mm -hmm. and not 2 to the 160. But of course, that, that implies 2 to the 80 memory or storage, which is a, a vast amount of storage. And there are trade-offs where you can do more work and store less, and there are also uh, cycle algorithms. One example of that is in the coin business, we have two coins that have drastically different proof-of-work functions, SHA-256 in Bitcoin, and then Script mm -hmm. in Litecoin. Script is much more memory-intensive, right. less CPU-intensive, and SHA-256 is all CPU. Let's back up a bit to Hashcash. So originally... I just modified the algorithm. So to connect it to a service, so you're trying to obtain service, so you want to create a proof of work essentially from this, but that is bound to a service. Mm -hmm. So if you have a service string, let's say an email address, a remailer address, a Usenet news group, and in Bitcoin's case, the Coinbase. Mm -hmm. And you vary something inside that, so a counter or something, and then you repeatedly hash it until you get a given output. The original proposal was to hash the service descriptor alone to produce one random output and use the leading bits of that as a fair challenge 
and then you'd use a counter in the second one, and you would change the counter until you find a, an output that matched the first one. So that's a kind of fair challenge concept. And at some point, two people, uh, Hal Finney, uh, for a guy called uh, Thomas Boschelieu, independently suggested that you don't need to choose a fair challenge because any arbitrary string, like the digits of pi or the all zero string, is also a fair challenge and slightly simpler. And then to verify the proof of work, you only need to invoke one hash rather than two hashes to Mm -hmm. be able to compare the strings. Out of this hash cache was born, and the concept, as as I understand, and and please explain it to us if I've got it wrong, is that by forcing people to do a bit of work and then proving that they did a bit of work before sending mail through the remailer, that puts a minimal burden on someone who's sending a message with content because they have the commitment and incentive to do it. But for someone who's just spamming, it would put an unreasonable burden and that doesn't scale. We talked about the context of remailers and it was used for that for some period of time and also as a anti-spam mechanism for email. So people who are spamming are often trying to, they have a profit motive and so it matters to them how many mails they can send per second with their given resources. So, mm-hmm. you know, they'll use thousands of BCCs in the headers to amplify the amount of mail they can send by having the mail server do some work for them and they will max out their network resources and so on. So what you can do with Hashcash is if each recipient of a mail requires a stamp that is bound to their email address, that means that somebody who's sending an email can't reuse a Hashcash stamp to send the same mail to two different people. So they're using a unique stamp for each recipient. And so a number of these tricks, like using BCC to have a mail server sent to lots of people at the cost of the traffic between the spammer and the mail server and again over the network once and sending to a thousand users. That's avoided, right, because 999 of them would reject the message if there was one stamp on it. Basically, it's an economic argument that whatever their profit margin is, which is obviously very slim because very few people would actually act on these uh, spams, but they can operate with you know one in a million clicking through and getting $5 from that because their cost is some tiny fraction of a cent. So by requiring a proof of work, there are only so many proofs of work they can do in an hour. And so the number of mails they can send per hour maybe drops by 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000. And you can vary the proof of work to tune this effect. So basically you want to have as high a proof of work as is not inconvenient to a regular user who is not engaged in spamming. So you know, if you're sending an email to a friend or colleague or family member and you click send, it takes 30 seconds or a minute. If it's computing the stamp while you're composing the email, you're essentially not really going to notice and it's not going to get in the way. Another thing to consider about the Hashcash proof of work is that it's non-interactive. The challenge that you use to compute the proof of work is done on your own computer. You don't need to talk to anybody first. So you don't need to contact your recipient or the web server that you're going to provide the proof of work to to ask it for some challenge or something to work on. You choose randomly a fair challenge you provide a proof of work that you did work on that challenge, and the challenge also involves the recipient's resource name, and then you send it to them. So that makes it basically, in distributed systems terms, 100% scalable. There's no new communication overhead, so it can be used in essentially any protocol and scale to internet scale. It could be used in email without having any communication effect. People used it, I mean, apart from remailers and mail. It was also used in larger quantities for name squatting. So the I2P anonymous networking protocol, which is a kind of Tor competitor, has a pseudonym concept. And to obtain a pseudonym, produce a much larger proof of work. So that's basically to discourage name squatting because people come along, they can ask for names cheaply at no cost. And so they would try to take all English word dictionaries or all common names and there would be no interesting names left. And you can see an aspect of that within Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has to contend with the Sybil attack, which is that when it's voting which transaction is uh, correct, so you've got many people in the network and you somehow have to agree amongst this distributed system which payment is correct, which payment came first, and that the payment is valid with respect to its preceding transaction inputs. The same situation as name squatting, an, an analogous situation exists for Bitcoin, which is that if somebody has an interest to influence the vote, saying the vote is just a one person, one vote, or one computer, one vote, they can uh, do a simple attack. So you know, if, if the system is looking at IP addresses to try to enforce one person for one vote, it's very easy for people with a botnet or 
mm-hmm. uh, cycling IP addresses to perform what's known as a civil attack, which is that one person can pretend to be a million people and get an undue amount of voting. So Bitcoin uses the proof of work to say, well, you get one vote per CPU cycle, essentially. So it's not fair in the sense of one vote per person, but it's less uh, abusable than the situation of one vote per IP address or something unenforceable. So it's at least it's strongly enforceable, shall we say. Hashcash, uh, you first published the paper in 2002, and then in uh, 2008 it was uh, cited in the Satoshi Nakamoto paper, and Satoshi suggested using it in order to do proof of work on a coin and digital cash system, which is probably now the most widespread application of the concept of proof of work, and certainly one of the most successful we've seen. The original concept of one CPU, one vote. Now we've seen this enormous explosion in hashing power as we very rapidly, because of the economic incentives existed, and there were very good economic incentives, we've moved very rapidly from CPUs to GPUs to FPGAs and now to ASICs. And there is some concern in the community at large and some discussion, a recurring discussion, probably a very good discussion to have about the risk of centralization, about the possibility of organizations with economic resources to acquire silicon from fabs, to be able to create massive proof-of-work farms, essentially, and either dominate Bitcoin with a nefarious purpose or simply dominate mining in order to funnel a lot of rewards in their direction. Do you share that concern? Do you, do you see the, the argument? And what's the risk of centralization? Yeah, I do, I do share that concern. And actually, uh, when I first joined the um, Bitcoin Dev Forum earlier this year, my, my reason for joining was to articulate this exact concern. And so my concern was that, and I guess many people arrive at this concern, is that because using SHA-1 as the hash function in Hashcash, the proof of work used in Bitcoin, because it's so simple, it's easy to run on you know, FPGAs, GPUs, ASICs, uh, to a significant and dominating advantage compared to less specialized hardware. Like a general purpose CPU. Right. So, I mean, we, we saw initially the initial version of Bitcoin, people were mining on a CPU. Quickly, they, people moved to GPUs and after that to FPGAs and then ASICs. And each move typically will render the previous generation of approach of mining type of hardware used completely unprofitable. It means that over time, Basically, you can't mine unless you have an ASIC. And so CPUs, everybody has CPUs and they have multiple uses. GPUs, you can generally get GPUs because people want to play games with them and video games and what have you. But as I understand it, there were also supply problems with GPUs because Bitcoiners were buying up the entire stock of Mm -hmm. GPUs. But at least that's something that consumers, the man in the street, can have a fair chance of buying as opposed to let's say, a large company uh, monopolizing uh, supply or something like that. So that's potentially an argument for S-Crypt, so to replace SHA-256 in Hashcash. So just uh, to back up a second, um, many cryptographic algorithms are based on building blocks. So we have building blocks such as SHA-1, SHA-256, um, AES, and so on. So, for example, with HMAC, you have HMAC SHA-1, HMAC SHA-256, HMAC MD5, and so on. So with Hashcash, it's very similar to HMAC. There's Hashcash, and the original Hashcash was using SHA-1. Bitcoin uses Hashcash with SHA-256 iterated twice. And S-Crypt uses Hashcash with the S-Crypt internal hash function. I think there's a slight confusion about S-Crypt because S-Crypt used for its original purpose is to stretch passwords, Mm -hmm. to make passwords harder to grind. And in that context, the S-Script has an iterator, typically 10,000 or 100,000 time iterations. And so it has its own hardness, but that hardness is not being used within Litecoin and other S-Script users. Um, Hashcash S-Script is really Hashcash and the internal S-Script function or S-Script iterated once, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it it makes use of the uh, memory hardness, but it doesn't make use of the S-Script iteration. And the reason that you can't do that is if you used S-Script's hardness by using S-Crypt's iterations, then when you came to verify the proof of work, you'd have to repeat the work. 
-hmm. so it would have an extremely expensive verification time. So there's a hash cache using SHA-256 versus hash cache using the S-Crypt internal hash function debate. The argument is that because the S-Crypt hash function artificially consumes memory, uh, it does actually have a time memory trade-off, but it's still more expensive in terms of memory, that it should be more resistant to implementation in ASICs. And so people use that as an argument to say that S-Crypt using Bitcoin clones may be more interesting or may, may be more resistant to centralization risks. However, there's, a, there's an interesting uh, counter-argument, which is that SHA-256 is a very simple algorithm that was originally designed to be simple to implement, simple and efficient to implement in hardware. And there are circuit layouts for SHA-256 available for free download on the internet. So potentially even somebody with relevant industry experience or academic experience in circuit hardware could make a small run of mining hardware themselves with their own savings. Conversely, with S-Crypt, because there's a barrier to entry, uh, it turns out it's not impossible to make an ASIC implementation. And in fact, there are rumors that, and even announcements, the two companies are doing just that right now. So as that succeeds, there's actually a much larger technical barrier to entry to create S-Crypt ASICs. So it actually turns out that the centralization risks are actually worse with S-Crypt. Because only the specialists will be able to design those circuits. <coughs> There'll be more limited supply. So, I mean, for example, it needs a low latency memory and the circuit design is much more complicated. And uh, another aspect of this argument uh, is that, well, in an, in an ideal world, you want you know, tens of thousands of people to be mining. Power users in their garage, people mining just for curiosity on a GPU or on a small ASIC, a USB ASIC, and we see some of those, just so that the um, mining power is distributed because there are specific risks that arise when policy risks and I'm possibly less concerned about the profit risks because basically anything anybody does to mine more efficiently means that the overall resources consumed to complete the Bitcoin distribution until it gets 21 million will consume less electricity and result in somebody getting some profit which hopefully they will reinvest in the Bitcoin industry or in general. Whereas if everybody is mining less efficiently, more resources get consumed. And so there's less money released to Bitcoin related industries. So the argument for ASICs is, so will we get decentralization with ASICs? So the question is about supply. And there are some interesting economic dynamics in there. So if somebody has put the minimum investment to make some ASICs, they have some incentives to consider. Will they mine them themselves? And people's first uh, reaction is typically that, well, this is a machine that lets you print virtual $100 bills. Why would you sell it? You know, surely you'd use it to mine as fast as you can and keep the proceeds. So one, one counter argument to that is the um, mining profitability once the system bootstrapped, perhaps after the first three or four years or so, the mining profitability margin dropped considerably. So there are actually risks to mining. So for example, many people ordered ASICs from companies on pre-order and by the time the ASICs arrived, it was kind of debatable whether it was even break-even that they would be able to, for the electricity cost, recoup their hardware investment. Now, the other dynamic is that people who are selling ASICs, there's a question of the hardware manufacturers that are making ASICs. I initially thought, well, what we need is a, is a Kickstarter so that there is free ready availability of ASICs if, if you subscribe to the supposition that people who manufacture ASICs are hoarding them for internal use. So we need maybe a Kickstarter with at cost or non-profit availability of these things to ensure decentralization. But actually the economic arguments that the ASIC manufacturers are operating under are interesting. And their argument is that there's a natural incentive for them to not overproduce and oversupply. Because if they do that, because the difficulty will ramp up, the profitability margin at a given Bitcoin price will drop to close to zero. For everyone, including yeah. their most recently shipped customers who will be annoyed. Right. And so that, that will mean that they won't have follow-on customers. People won't buy anymore or that they'll have to sell them at a slimmer margin. So they would destroy their own business and they would remove profitability. So there's a natural shelling point for them to sell at a margin so they make a profit their customers make a profit, but they don't make too much of a margin so that somebody else has an incentive to step into the market or optimize their own ASIC, their competing ASICs, to match the efficiency. So then it basically becomes a kind of economically balanced supply function. Shop smart with your Bitcoin and get 3% back with GIFT. On GIFT, you can get gift cards with Bitcoin. Choose from over 200 retailers, including Target, GameStop, Gap, and more. 
Gift makes it easy to shop on Android or on the web. There are no additional fees, and when you shop with Bitcoin, you get 3% back. Go ahead, try Gift. That's G-Y-F-T dot com. Hi, listener. Here at Let's Talk Bitcoin, we're building a global network of correspondents able to contribute on the ground perspective when cryptocurrency related information comes across their filters. If you'd like to join our global conversation, send an email with your name and geographic or cultural niche to apply at letstalkbitcoin.com. Just like Bitcoin, the only barrier to entry is your time and good work. Thanks for listening. So taking this a, a step further, we've really squeezed out all of the optimization that we can get down to 28 nanometers. And at this point, the actual algorithm SHA-256 can't be optimized, really not much more, and certainly not orders of magnitude more. And so we're locked into Moore's law. So from this point on, it's really about chip density and access to fabs. But the other interesting effect that's happening is that now the density of the chip can't change, but the number of chips you can put within an enclosure, your ability to dissipate heat and feed power to it, has pushed this game into the realm of high-density data centers. So things like liquid cooling are coming back. We're seeing these 19-inch, four-unit rack-mountable hashing rigs that are even going to push the limits of data center capacity with 25-kilowatt racks and high-density, high-thermal output situations, which again makes it a much, much more specialized function, a much more specialized industry, which requires large capital investments as well as skills and personnel to manage. Essentially, now there's a building that comes with it that's wrapped around this hashing infrastructure, which is the data center and its cooling and power facilities. Do you see that as an additional danger for centralization? Yeah, so that, that clearly is a danger for centralization. At the beginning of your comment there, you mentioned as, as the ASICs were introduced, they were in a process of catching up with Moore's Law. So we've got a, a kind of S-curve that's terminating in Moore's Law and then following uh, CPU technologies. But actually, uh, talking with some ASIC mining vendors uh, yesterday, I'm surprised to hear that they're actually shipping 20 nanometers first quarter next year, which may mean that they are actually surpassing uh, CPU vendors in being the first to produce the next generation from 28 nanometers on the TSMC line. So it may be, which is a kind of amusing situation that there's actually more economic incentive to push harder and faster to get to 20 nanometer and 14 nanometers for ASIC miners than there is actually for CPUs. And actually there are some advantages that ASIC hashing has over CPUs in terms of simplicity because you don't really care so much about error rates because you have many, many hashing units and if some of them fail, you just disable them. So they can probably tolerate higher error rates. They can adopt earlier technologies when the error rates are higher. They can push the limits harder and still get very useful function from ASIC hardware. So we should be paying attention to the ASIC market as the new front runners of Moore's Law. That's uh, and all of the economic incentives have pushed us there. Yeah, I mean it's it's a kind of a curious situation, but there seems to be what's happening if the ASIC mining companies are able to deliver on their projections. So just a quick clarification here: we're talking about centralization, and some people confuse this as a concern about someone being able to mount a 51% attack. For me, this is a much simpler problem, which is that every single feature development or change in the code or other modifications of the core Bitcoin protocol has to go through a process of consensus and adoption by the miners. And by having a very broad population of miners, you expose that decision to the broadest consensus mechanism of voting possible. I see that as a bigger concern than the 51% type of attack. Am I down the right path, or, or am I missing something? So, I mean, one of the concerns with centralization is that you might see policy enforced at the miners, and if the miners are extremely powerful, and you actually get the same situation with pools, in fact, even though the pools mostly don't own their own mining resources, just because most people are not using a get block templates. So the situation you have is that the mining pool, or the, or the centralized miner, is a full node in the network, it is looking at all the transactions, constructing a candidate block and performing proof of work on it. And with the pools, they're doing the same thing, but they're providing the block, or well, the hash of the block, the Coinbase, for the individual end users doing mining under that pool to work on. And that's actually a, a bad situation because it means that centralization is, in the case of pools, artificially centralized in the pool operator, 
where there's no particular reason that the pool users couldn't be full nodes, and that's what GetBlock template provides, actually. Essentially, the pool operator doesn't even need to mine at all. They just need to be running a pool, and they get the vote of every participant in the pool, right. as long as they're not obnoxious about it and cause everyone to leave the pool, but it puts a lot of power in their hands without any hashing. Right. So, and I, I think the risk that is created for centralization is kind of policy risk. So you could imagine that as mining pools which own their old own hardware or which have hardware that is leased by users on a mining contract, as they become bigger enterprises, they may be stock market listed companies or limited companies. And so they're vulnerable to court orders within their jurisdiction. And the interest to serve them a court order is relational to their proportion of power in the network. So you know, if somebody wanted to block a given set of transactions or a given receiving address or a given sending address or selection of sending addresses, they could issue a court order, maybe even with a gag order so that it's not clear to anybody else. You know, so they're not allowed to talk about the fact that they're blocking these transactions. And if in a few years 90% of the mining power is in the hands of a few dozen stock market listed companies across a few countries in the world, if somebody can issue court orders on significantly more than 50% of them, they can uh, disrupt payments Bitcoin provides a number of interesting new features relative to the banking network. So the fact that you can't seize client assets, that you can't block individuals from receiving payments, and we saw this with WikiLeaks. Uh, kind of, um, as I understand it, the U.S. government applied to the relevant department to ask for WikiLeaks to be put on an embargoed recipient list, and that was rejected. So outside of the established legal process, nevertheless, uh, senior politicians contacted payment vendors and persuaded them outside of the law to block these transactions. So mm -hmm. That's another example of the risk of centralization. So the credit card vendors and PayPal are in a, in a very centralized position. So we have to avoid this kind of situation occurring in Bitcoin. And actually, I made a technical proposal to combat this situation. So there are a number of things you can do about centralization. Obviously, one of them is to try and combat centralization technically to introduce diseconomies of scale or encourage users to choose their blocks when they're mining with a pool. There's no reason for the user not to be a full node choose their own blocks, and that obviates the artificial possibility for the pool to exercise their voting power. They can exercise their voting power directly while still benefiting from the reduced variance that comes from operating through a pool. So now going back to this proposal I made to do with avoiding policy tax from large miners. So if we imagine a situation where there are 10 mining pools in the world, they have approximately 10% each, but they're stock market listed companies, and it's very easy for them to be served with gag orders and court orders and so on. And there is a significant policy attack going on. They are blocking transactions and so on. So in this situation, what you want to do is to be able to transact where they can't block transactions from the, on the sending side. They can't block senders and they can't block recipients. And it turns out that you can do that, surprisingly. And the way that you do it is you essentially, to simplify slightly, encrypt the transaction that you would have sent onto the Bitcoin blockchain uh, with symmetric key encryption in such a way that if it is double spent, that can still be detected. The miners validate that the encrypted transaction hasn't been double spent in the normal way. And uh, obviously, they can't t because it's encrypted, they can't tell who the sender is, who the recipient is, what the inputs are how much money is involved at that point, and yet they're still doing a partial, like a simplified validation, the, the expensive part of the validation, the hashing. So after, say, six blocks, or when the recipient needs to respend the money they've received, and the users can privately send the encryption key between them. So if I'm sending you uh, one of these encrypted transactions, I can send the encrypted transaction on the blockchain, and I can privately send you the key, or I can encrypt the key to your public key and attach it to the encrypted message, or we can just simply wait six blocks. So once once we broadcast it, we'll wait six blocks or so, six, sorry, six confirmations or so, until it's been confirmed by the miners. And then we release the key to the network. And when we release the key to the network, we don't need any validation of that key because it's self-verifiable against the encrypted message. If the key's wrong, the result is garbage, the checksums fail. And so in this way, you can extract policy immunity, even in a situation of centralized control. And this has been discussed under the heading of committed transactions, hidden transactions. Or... Now, if in this situation, the miners had a very strong incentive for some reason to undo a transaction. So they learn after the fact that the transaction that they would have liked to block has gone through. In this situation, you know, maybe they expend some enormous resources or, or hire some uh, 
rented equipment to undo the transaction. In order to do that, they have to fight against their previous work. So but recalculating the six blocks yeah, I mean, minimum that have elapsed. Right, they'd have to offer their own previous work. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe if there are enough court orders, uh, enough of these centralized miners, they can do this. It's, it's unprofitable, but maybe a court can order them to do that, or maybe a court can pay them to do that if they care to. That kind of partly and does the benefit of what we're talking about. It, it's some cost, but they can still do it. So there's two things you can say about that. Um, one thing is that you can very trivially frustrate that and make that approach completely impractical, which is that you can do it again. You can publish another small transaction every block. You can publish hundreds of small transactions every block and not reveal the keys. Every time they redo the work, you reveal another key. So basically, you could stall their mining contributions. And mm -hmm. while they're doing this, people who are not engaging in sensor resistance are moving forward on an alternative chain. So I think basically what it comes down to is that the next stage from this is that people say, well, you know, maybe the miners will demand that encrypted transactions not be allowed, that they not be used. They simply reject encrypted transactions. But I think that's actually a technical misunderstanding and that it's actually the end users with the wallets that decide on the protocol. The miners can't change the protocol, even though they have all the hashing power, or say a large proportion of the hashing power. All of the hashing power is slightly more complicated. But say that something like 50 or 60% of the hashing power is still in private hands. Essentially, the end users with their wallets and not the miners, private or public, you know, privately owned as in power users or publicly listed companies, neither or the com combination of those actually has voting control over the protocol. And the reason I say that is, say that we uh, implement encrypted transactions into the Bitcoin protocol and the miners try to vote against this at some point. Now, if they vote against it, it means they drop the transactions. And at that point, they've basically created an altcoin with no users. Mm -hmm. And the users continue with the miners that don't implement this policy. Resets the difficulty somewhat. It does. And that's why I mentioned that it's difficult to do that if 90% of the hashing power is in the hands of your enemy. Uh, shall we say in uh, security terms, you talk about the adversary or enemy. In the case that hashing power is somewhat distributed, but you know geographically distributed in different countries and some non-trivial proportion in power user or small company hands. Uh, and, and the jurisdictional arguments are non-trivial as well in the sense that it can be more difficult to obtain synchronized court orders across many jurisdictions. And the mining hardware people I talked to yesterday and discussed these kind of uh, risks with since they have shipped hardware to hundreds of countries. And they're not all sold in large batches. They're going to smaller orders as well. So it, it is actually uh, relatively distributed. And so in that, in that kind of picture, if we can maintain that picture, and use encrypted transactions, it actually turns out that even though the users don't have the hashing power, they can still have the protocol control. And I think that's interesting. So it's, it's a, an alternative form of defense. You know? So if technically we, it turns out that we're unable to provide this economies of scale, or for whatever reason, discourage users from using pools in a manner like using the wrong interface, using it where they let the pool make the, do the voting. They should do it where they do the voting themselves. And there is, there is a mechanism to do this called get block template, uh, which is offered by the Eligius pool, which has about 10% of hashing power and actually much lower fees than the other networks. I, I always wonder why Eligius doesn't have a much higher portion of the network. Going back to the encrypted transactions, another interesting observation is that it turns out that you can re-spend an encrypted transaction in encrypted form, which is kind of interesting. So if I give you an encrypted transaction, you have the key to verify the value because you can decrypt it and so you can go back and see where it came from, uh, you know, a mining event or a previous unencrypted transaction where the values are exposed and the chain of custody of ownership is exposed. So you can follow that trail, but you can turn around and make a new encrypted transaction referencing your encrypted transaction as the input and get that validated, you know, so you're spending it to somebody else and then you provide them privately the key. So you don't broadcast the key in this case, but you provide privately the key to my input transaction and to your new transaction. And the recipient can verify the chain so they can see that, uh, okay, your transaction appears to be valid and it has the required value. And the inputs from your transaction, they have the key to go back and fetch the encrypted transaction that is the input, decrypt that, and then validate it. So in that way, you can have a new kind of transaction privacy model, which is that only the parties to the transaction can see who sent the transaction, who received the transaction, and the amounts involved in the transaction. And you can essentially keep this up indefinitely. The only limitation which I've not found a nice way to address so far is that the privacy gets eroded over time. So if you imagine you know, 10 people are involved in this transaction chain, 
the most recent transaction recipient can see the entire history of right. transaction payments. You can look backwards but not forwards. Exactly. So somebody in the middle can look backwards but they can't look forwards. So there's, there's some kind of privacy in there. Not everybody sees everything, but the latest person sees everything. And so if everybody was using in encrypted transactions, payments get mixed together, eventually everybody would be able to see everything. But still, for perhaps a private group of people who are relatively close in it, they could retain some privacy or retain a wallet that segregated addresses that were used for encrypted transactions. And I think this is an interesting and desirable, potentially, security model if we can find a way to make this work in a general sense. It retains a possibility for the conventional investigative procedures that law enforcement use, which is they follow a particular crime that they're trying to investigate and they look at external parties that interacted with the person who committed the crime. So, you know, the car rental company, the hotel, and they will go to those entities and issue them with a subpoena for their business records. So you could see that working in this context that we have encrypted private transactions that flow between a group of people. Some of them will be businesses that are completely innocent and uninvolved in a hypothetical crime. And they can be supplied with a subpoena and reveal the information they have and provide visibility inside this. But at the same time, uh, phishing expeditions and the kind of mass scale a priori uh, network analysis of funds flows, private communications, all these kinds of things is prevented. And I think most people in society viewed that, and actually the law views that, as the correct balance for society. So, for example, many of the things the NSA has been doing with harvesting information, it seems is illegal. And even the author of the relevant law in the U.S., has come out and Trump said... Trump's son, Brenner, who said this is not what we intended exactly. with the Patriot Act. Yeah. So even the author of the Patriot Act says that the way they've been interpreting or abusing this act is not legal from his perspective, and there's a whole story, side story to that. So you're providing era. a neat solution where <clears throat> the type of targeted investigative analysis of transactions is possible by finding the legal entry into the chain of transactions and compelling disclosure backwards, right. uh, but only on a selective basis. But you can't scale that up to ubiquitous surveillance, thereby forcing them to revert to the original mission, which is investigating specific targets rather than all of us right. a priori. That's what society authorized. All the things we see above that are unauthorized and essentially illegal actions. about the future of Bitcoin. One of the, I think, key understandings is that Bitcoin as an invention, the combination of a distributed asset ledger with proof of work that enables both currency and many other potential applications in the future, Bitcoin as a protocol, Bitcoin as a network, can survive Bitcoin the currency, in that Bitcoin the currency could fail and we could start a different version or a new version or implement an altcoin that provides better solutions to our problems. Obviously, none of us want that to happen. But one of the arguments is that all of the cryptographic algorithms and the core mechanisms can be tweaked to generate other outcomes or to highlight different properties of the system if we find that some of the properties that were in the original implementation are not suitable. Right. I mean, I, you see that argument put forward for supporting altcoins. And personally, I'm not really a fan of altcoins. And I have a couple of reasons for this. Bitcoin was a, a kind of one-off event the uh, creation of a new concept of digital virtual scarcity. So it really is a kind of digital gold, a scarce virtual commodity. And I think that it's not clear that it's desirable or good for even the confidence in the concept of digital virtual scarcity if there were to be another event where an altcoin were to take over. Mm -hmm. So I more push the view that we should add the new features that we need to Bitcoin. It can be challenging for Bitcoin itself to accept too many innovative changes too fast because they have an extremely high security bar to protect the value, which is in the $10 billion plus range now of the system. So I mean, they have the kind of quality assurance requirements of the flight control system of an A380 Airbus Super Jumbo or what have you. Being patched uh, while in flight. Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> so you have to be really, really careful about doing that. And so they're rightly conservative with adding features. And so I uh, try to work out, and uh, I think I found a, a plausible approach. So, I mean, they have a test net where they put bug fixes or 
small enhancements to have a test environment to shake out things. But I think that's not quite the same thing as being able to add new features. So, for example, you notice that many of the scripting languages features are disabled so that some interesting smart contracts are not possible and that it turns out the input values are not within the transactions. They're not within the transact the validated part of the transaction. So it creates problems for offline wallets. Mm -hmm. They can't easily verify the values involved, and so they have to import much more data than would be necessary. So it kind of makes that complicated. So that there are actually many interesting things that could be added, and you see that in terms of altcoins focusing on uh, adding features, so adding trading features or new transaction features, so for example. Mark Friedenberg proposed a very nice clean set of extensions to the scripting language to support more trading functions. Very much the cleanest set of extensions I've seen posed for sort of being able to issue an order and for anybody to match that atomically, directly, and, and other uh, clear next step trading functions. That would allow the kind of uh, distributed exchange for Bitcoin or possibly Bitcoin into other currencies or even other types of shares that solves a big single point of failure right now of the concentrated on-ramps and off-ramps of the exchanges. Right. So, I mean, you see with colored coins an approach to add new concepts by uh, watermarking or tagging Bitcoin so you can take a nominal value Bitcoin and attach an, an external value, so like a US dollar value from an issuer or a gold value from a gold depository. Um, you have an issue of risk there, but uh, that's implied in any kind of non-digital virtual scarcity asset, essentially, so that's unavoidable. Coming back to the way that we can move Bitcoin forward, so I think it's actually detrimental that people try to implement features outside of Bitcoin. I mean, it seems that there's a profit motive that they hope that by adding some nominal feature to an altcoin, they can mine it early they can become very rich. Right. Most of the altcoins actually have no transactional volume. Literally, the blocks are empty. So from a transactional point of view, you can consider the value of a virtual currency or actually any currency as there's some kind of metric involving the amount of money in circulation and the velocity of that money. That gives a kind of metric of the intrinsic value of the currency. So we don't know exactly what proportion of the Bitcoin's market cap is intrinsic value versus speculative value, but clearly it has a very high intrinsic value because it provides unique functions to users, it has deployment, it has payment processes, integration, hardware and so forth, and all of the altcoins have none of this mm -hmm. and no transactions. I view them as sort of interesting experiments. Laboratory. So uh, in the future, when we look at Bitcoin, there's sort of this balance to strike between modifying, if you like, the core protocol, changing the transaction script or changing core features around uh, mining, proof of work, etc., versus leaving that mostly alone and implementing some of these things in layers above by some of the techniques that have been demonstrated to introduce other layers of protocols within the transactions. Mm -hmm. but. Some of the core capabilities of the protocol, and we've been discussing anonymity and privacy in transactions, these are things that need to be implemented at the lowest level right. layer possible. So where do you see that balance? What do we really need to get into the core protocol before we stop messing with it and then say, from now on, really limit the amount of development? As with TCPIP, it reached the point where it was good enough, and then we could move most of the development to the layers above, and just let it ride the network effect and become more and more dominant simply through its broad utility and adoption. Right. I, th I think that should be the correct target that you want to arrive at eventually core properties and essentially never change the base level after that. Unfortunately, Bitcoin has some non-ideal properties. So, for example, the fungibility layer is mm -hmm. imperfect, which is to say the reason, and maybe people don't appreciate this, that you know people say that, okay, Bitcoin's an anonymous uh, e-cash system, but actually it's not that anonymous if, if not used carefully, and it's not that anonymous even if used carefully, or it's very easy to make mistakes, and all the values and exchanges are public. But actually the reason to have anonymity at the transaction layer is to support fungibility, which is the concept that one dollar bill should be exchangeable from another dollar bill, and that if you received a dollar bill that was in the distant past involved in a crime, and presumably pretty much all dollar bills are, that as a result of criminal investigation, the dollar bill in your pocket shouldn't be seized or 
evaporate, right? So right, which is something that was resolved in the 1700s in Scotland through legal proceedings and has become part of the common law of currencies for the last two centuries. Right. And, and yet in Bitcoin, we're having this discussion at the moment of blacklisting and whitelisting and redlisting and various types of filters destroying the fungibility. I see this as, a, as an extreme threat that could effectively be an extinction level threat to Bitcoin if implemented because it would shift the power from the two parties involved in the transaction to a third counterparty that controls the list. Right. It seems to stem from a misunderstanding about where Bitcoin gets one of its main core advantages. So one of Bitcoin's main core advantages is that it's immediately and instantly settled. So it's an irrevocable payment. And that reduces the traditional costs of arbitration fraud management. So you see with credit cards, due to arbitration and fraud management, they have fees in the sort of 3 to 5% plus 50 cent plus per transaction. And PayPal has perhaps some kind of similar cost structure because they also have to handle the same kinds of issues. So as I was saying, there's a very clean transaction layer, which is kind of mathematically perfect. If you introduce dispute arbitration into the transaction layer, you introduce costs into it, the immediate final settlement goes away. Now merchants have to buy insurance or engage escrow parties to do arbitration, and none of these things are free. So at that point, the Bitcoin's transactional cost advantage will disappear. And right. there'll, be, there'll be no transactional cost advantage versus credit cards. The BitGive Foundation is a non-profit charitable giving organization leveraging the power of the Bitcoin community to improve public health and the environment worldwide. Help us demonstrate the significant impact of Bitcoin in addressing these critical issues on a global scale. Support international giving in Bitcoin. Please visit our website at www.bitgivefoundation.org. That's www.bitgivefoundation.org. Let's Talk Bitcoin is heard each week by thousands of people who are participating in the new digital economy. Our listener base of Bitcoin owners, miners, investors, technologists, and merchants is growing fast. We offer a limited number of short advertising slots in each show to keep our listeners engaged and to provide maximum impact for our sponsors. If you'd like to talk to us about Let's Talk Bitcoin, send us an email at sponsors at letstalkbitcoin.com. Another way to look at it, and something I've been talking about a lot, is, is the concept of neutrality, Bitcoin neutrality. The internet provides neutrality as to sender, recipient, and content of message. It provides routing of these messages and packets without considerations as the sender and recipient. And in, in Bitcoin, we have the same thing. The sender, recipient, value, and content of the transaction script. Uh, do not determine whether your transaction will be routed, simply whether it is a valid transaction and, and whether the output can be properly verified and used as an input in the next transaction. These schemes break that neutrality and would introduce a level of centralization that would not allow you to do innovation at the edges anymore. Yeah, I guess that's true also. So what I was thinking of in terms of the idealized features for a distributed electronic cash system, we were exploring this in sort of 1998, 1999 time frame with sort of Way Days, B-Money, Hal Finney was involved, some anonymous people, one of whom may have been Satoshi, it's not clear. And Nick Sabo made a, a related proposal called BitGold. It, it involved broadcast to avoid uh, the risks of centralization. And actually, it, it related to a specific previous failed experiment with a centralized solution. So there's a company in the sort of 1995 era who had a electronic cash technology invented by David Chaum, who's really kind of the, the progenitor of electronic cash because he invented the blind signature with uh, very interesting applications for electronic cash and is a very clever cryptographer. Um, so he started this company in the Netherlands called uh, DigiCash and they put up a demonstration electronic cash server. The uh, actual end game was to obtain banking licenses or partner with banks and exchange electronic cash tokens worth exactly one US dollar for US dollar. So there's no kind of virtual scarcity involved, but there is immediate and final settlement and also the concept of the user holding their own token. So it's kind of virtual digital bearer certificate, so a kind of electronic version of a bearer bond. Yeah, bearer full control address. in the hands yeah. of the person who has possession. Right, so they put up this demo server with no banking connection and a kind of uh, Bitcoin Forcer equivalent thing, which is you could just email them and they send you a few coins. 
And so people on the uh, cryptography list were very interested in deploying electronic cash because you can immediately see with any kind of encryption or privacy-related or network privacy-related technologies or internet services that you can make things work more smoothly if you can have money involved. And sometimes it's difficult to have money involved where there's no transactional privacy if you're trying to provide privacy-related services. So people pretty much viewed electronic cash as the holy grail of the privacy technologies they were exploring. Anyway, so this Betabook server, people got interested and thought, well, you know, why don't we start buying and selling things and see if we can inflate the balloon? There's scarcity. They promised, Digicash promised, to only ever issue a million of these and to leave it running, basically. And so I I sold some T-shirts relating to encryption policy at the time and other people sold other things. And, you know, if that had been able to run its course, perhaps within a year or two within a community of a few thousand interested people, that might actually have floated and achieved a value. But unfortunately, around that time, Digicash went bankrupt and the server got shut down. And because of its architecture, the uh, double spend database, which defines the value, basically you, you end up holding a coin that you fully control, but it's defined with respect to a double spend database. If a double spend database disappears, nobody knows whether your coin was already spent or not. And they have no proof of that. So Mm -hmm. all the coins became worthless overnight. And so it was within that context that Wade proposed B-Money, and I presume that Nick Zabo proposed BitGold also. So you basically try and distribute that double spend database. And also Wade particularly had proposed to try to create a distributed electronic currency uh, without a banking interface by using Hashcash as a kind of virtual mining function. And some aspects of his proposal were kind of slightly vague or, you know, high-level broad brushstrokes. But so I think one of the things was you, you would send a hash cash proof of work, which is non-transferable, to a group of cloud servers, and they would issue with a blind token or would track ownership in some not fully defined way. And in this discussion, I proposed that, well, if you mine a coin yourself, you don't need to exchange it with a server. It, it is a virgin coin, so that's kind of the uh, Bitcoin virgin coin concept, the virgin Mm -hmm. mind coin that is valid in itself. And Nick Zabo had a kind of related idea involving a collectible market. So you can see that when you mine these things, there's more law going on and people jumping in so that you get bigger and bigger hash cash stamps over time. And so apparently there's a collectible market. So I guess Nick Zabo has a um, more experience in markets and law and other aspects of the existing financial ecosystem. So he had picked out a specialized kind of market called a collectible market, where apparently people will, specialist uh, traders will piece together collectible assets like rare postage stamps and things like that and put them together into a bundle with a fixed value, even though the components have different ages and scarcities and values. So he's proposing a collectibles market to stabilize the value of these changing, like increasingly less scarce stamps. Unfortunately, neither of these systems had any way to control inflation. So we were thinking, I mean, actually my kind of design consideration going into it is that I was aiming for inflation-adjusted US dollar. So basically what I was trying to achieve was that if you wanted to get a US dollar in electronic cash, what you would do is you would burn a US dollar's worth of electricity. So if you didn't have the time on your computer to do that, you would go rent it from a big compute farm. Within a few seconds, you'd get back your US dollar and you'd pay your US dollar in fees. And that's an interesting and, in fact, extremely fair distribution model because nobody gets rich. And you can get it on demand and there's no limitation. There's no supply curve. It fully meets demand. And once you have a dollar... You can't convert it back, but you can use it within the system. So mm-hmm. there's some kind of stabilization would occur. It's like virtualizing that dollar, essentially. Right. So it's kind of an attractive proposition, but unfortunately, I kind of uh, stalled on that because you can't really do that. Well, I mean, you can do it. Somebody can buy a computer every month, the most efficient, cost-effective computer, measure how big a stamp it can produce for a dollar's worth of electricity, and set an exchange rate. But unfortunately, that's a centralized event. That that per- that race setter becomes the Ben Bernanke or... <laughs> you know, the uh, monetary policy unit of the virtual currency, and that's undesirable. You want a distributed so, situation so you could have multiple people doing that, but it's still undesirable. It involves humans, human judgment, and so on. And so alternatively, we looked also at what could be done without reference to an external entity, and you could see that if you just left it, uh, you can mine as fast as you want, and a coin is, you know, 20 bits or something, which was the default hash cache size, a million iterations of a hash. Uh, with Moore's Law and increasing demand, you would have a supply-side inflation tracking Moore's Law or worse, which we viewed as uh, too violent to be a practical adoption mechanism. And conversely, if we put a cap, as Betabooks, Digicash Betabooks uh, experiment had of saying, you know, 
one million or one billion of these currency units, we would have had violent deflation if we just started from that. And somebody, I mean, and who would own them, right? So, and then if somebody pre-mined them all definitionally and handed them out, that puts them in a position of power. Alternatively, if you have, you know, free for all people mining you'd have a, a period of hyperinflation followed by hyperdeflation, and we just viewed this as an untenable. If, we, if, we, if we'd have figured out a way to control that, we, there were lots of people there raring to go to implement it. But we just figured that this was uncontrollable and so not, not plausible as an adoption mechanism. And actually, curiously, there was one of the people that was participating in this discussion anonymously seemed more interested to continue this line of thinking. He kind of like his last post in the thread was that this seems a very promising avenue and should be explored further. So... Possibly you could think that might have been Satoshi, and he's been mulling it over ever since, and finally got around to... So about a decade of mulling it over. Yeah, I mean, possibly with... Uh, I mean, who knows, you know, I, I, I guess I, I heard indirectly that somebody said that he had said approximately how long he'd been working on it, maybe a couple of years or something, so maybe you know, a period of mulling it over and some ideas emerging, and then uh, two years of implementation. I mean, so the missing part we had there back in 98 and 99, and this thread is on the Cypherbanks list. It's still there. You can go look at it. It's kind of interesting. Bit of it's now the historical record <laughs> for the birth of our new currency. Right, e-cash archaeology or something. Yeah. Uh, the, the missing feature that we had there was how to control this inflation. So because of my asking the wrong question and looking for exactly $1 cost to mining. And there's a downside to that, which is an extremely inefficient method of deployment. If you literally adopted that, which I was thinking about at the time, actually, and it went to global scale, we would basically burn a trillion dollars worth of coal to get a trillion dollars worth of electronic currency to operate with it. And that would be a, a quite undesirable outcome. So I think Satoshi's main big innovation was to come up with a mathematical supply function, which kind of solved three problems. It's, it's an internal reference is fully decentralized. It achieves more efficient distribution because the electricity costs are much lower. I mean, even at this stage now that we have mining, there's not actually that strong an incentive to go crazy and buy lots and lots of ASIC mining equipment because you'll just remove the profit motive, essentially. Mm -hmm. So there is an equilibrium. And you know, the people that mined early on, they did it for very negligible cost. So they were lucky, but they, were, they also produced an efficient, electrically efficient distribution of electronic cash. And the final thing that this uh, mathematical supply function created was a drive to adoption. So, I mean, even though it's a supply-side inflation, it's experienced as deflation from the user's point of view, i.e. the coins that you hold going up in value, because the rate of adoption has exceeded the supply-side inflation. So over the first four years, 50% of coins were mined, so it's 12.5% a year. Now we're in a six and a quarter percent a year, and after that we'll be going to three and an eighth. So... Um, you know, so within three years, you can see the supply side inflation is quite low and comparable to existing national currencies already. It seems that the parameters of the system were very well chosen. I mean, maybe with some very clever and careful economic modelling, or maybe with some luck and uh, good guesswork, you know, educated guesswork. But yes, obviously we know that now because it has worked, and so we can exactly. say that the parameters were well chosen. But when it was first suggested, I think a lot of people point at it and laughed and said, this can't possibly work, which is probably the hallmark of many good inventions in science. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really curious uh, situation that I actually, uh, the only Bitcoins I own, I bought in the market this year. I mined, you know, three quarters of Bitcoin on a GPU. Uh, my son has a couple of small ASIC miners, a teenage son at the moment that he's mining. But I was aware of and participated in this previous attempt to inflate the bubble. I was aware of Bitcoin from like September 2008 because Satoshi sent me an email and he sent me another email in January so it's uh, September 2008 he sent me another email in January 2009 saying I've released the uh, alpha version of the client, download it try it out and I didn't <laughs> Yeah, I sat outside the market and sort of was I mean I was very interested technically in what he'd achieved and I read with interest how Finney's the experiments in uh, exploring you know, how it worked, trying it out, asking technical comments and engaging Satoshi and others in discussion of this on the crypto list, and I participated in that myself. But for whatever reason, it, the connection to the inflation or the probability of the, uh, the balloon inflating didn't catch me until I saw like $100 and billion dollar market cap, and I thought, oh, it's happened. <laughs> <laughs>
So, right, well, of, that's a relief because many of us missed a, a couple of iterations of that and felt really dumb for not noticing it earlier. Yeah. And and to know that someone who, who has been as influential in the development of these technologies could also miss it. it, it it's really one of those things that in theory seems bizarre, but then suddenly when it gains the market traction, it all falls into place. And in hindsight, it's very easy to say, well, yeah, obviously this was the right way to do it. But that's really just observer bias. Yeah, I mean, so you could, you could say that I was dumber than everybody else because I had prior experience of attempts to uh, inflate a currency. I understood the cryptography and the principles involved, and I tried to design something similar in the past. So yeah, I, I have trouble explaining to myself why I didn't. But I mean, I think. I think it's harder for, for someone who's so involved in these things and, and also sees many of the alternative options that could be chosen to, to see which one is the right one, whereas a lot of the adoption we see right now is probably just speculative sentiments and has nothing to do with understanding the fundamentals. In fact, the more you understand the fundamentals, the more excited you are about how amazing it is that this is all working. As I recall it, I mean, it's a few years now ago that I was thinking, well, I recognized it as a bootstrap experiment, obviously, and I thought that's an interesting bootstrap experiment, but for some reason it felt like it was a very big inflation job. Uh, the balloon was fast, so that's to say that it was starting at a very tiny level and it had a very big area to reach, so it seemed quite low probability to reach it, but in hindsight that's not actually very much the case. It had almost identical characteristics to the beta books server. Anyway, so I'm not at all bitter about it. I have skin in the game because I bought bitcoins with my own money. They went up, I don't know, like three times or something at the moment. Um, and it's still really early days. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're still on the foothills, so there's plenty of opportunity to, uh, to help form this new industry. Right. I wanted to say something also. So looking at it from the outside, you see, when, when I was exploring electronic uh, cash, I had the background of looking at the cryptographic side where they have all these advanced experimental protocols. So you see David Chalm's eCash and David Chalm's uh, PhD student, who's a friend of mine, uh, Stefan Brands, um, developed a much more sophisticated form of electronic cash with many more features and flexibilities. That these things have uh, cryptographic blinding, which enables you to have mathematically perfect fungibility. And so when, and, uh, when I saw Bitcoin, I saw that it had a kind of fudge for its fungibility level. So to my point of view, that was not ideal. So, I mean, potentially if it had a more idealized uh, fungibility layer, I might have been more excited about its prospects. Now, obviously, it's very difficult to achieve a distributed version because Stefan Brown's technology and before him, David Chaum's technology are single server technologies or potentially cluster of server. You see Open Transactions has a kind of federated model where they have a semi-trustless group of Chaum or other kind of centralized cache servers that can perform some kind of hybrid, you know, some interesting properties, less vulnerable to centralization risks as, you know, central server digicache type servers, but less decentralized than Bitcoin itself. So it's actually quite technically challenging to obtain cryptographic anonymity within Bitcoin. And some of the esoteric crypto protocols for doing these things are experimental and it can be, can be a risk for when there's real money at stake to use very cutting edge experimental crypto protocols because they may be broken in a period of 10 years. And even if they've been around for 15 years, let's say, if they've been esoteric and there's no, been no real reason to analyze them, they might not actually have had that much work put into it. But actually there was a protocol which was compatible with distributed use, which is a paper by Sandra and Tashma called Auditable Electronic Cash, which was published in 1999. And that involves a, a zero-knowledge proof of uh, set membership. And the ZeroCoin paper refers to that. And ZeroCoin is essentially an optimization of the anonymous auditable eCash. So when I first saw Bitcoin, my immediate thought was, well, oh, you could have used uh, Sandra and Tashma's auditable anonymous electronic cash protocol fits perfectly with the network properties of this system and would provide a perfect fungibility layer. Now, unfortunately, Sandra Tashmore's protocol is somewhat computationally heavy and inefficient because it involves can-choose uh, cryptographic proofs, which involve multiple rounds and large messages and so on. And you see that ZeroCoin uh, has the same problems. It's an optimization, but even with that optimization, it's still almost impractically inefficient. You know, the coins are sort of 20 to 40 kilobytes per coin. They have a single denomination. So you typically, let's say you would need to have a one cent coin 
I want to send you fifty dollars, I have to send you, you know, five thousand times forty kilobytes of data, or I have to split the coins up into denominations, so in like in powers of two, one cent, two cent, four cent, heading up to, you know, sixteen thousand three hundred eighty-four cents. And by doing that, you would reduce the anonymity set, so you would weaken the anonymity and still let it be significant expense. So I do see desirability of having cryptographic anonymity, and apparently the guys at John Hopkins University, Matthew Green and colleagues, have a new paper that is in the works. They've been sort of making comments about that they're going to publish it soon, so we'll see what that achieves. They claim to have achieved some uh, much greater efficiency, and I guess not too much can be said about it yet because they haven't formally published it. But I think the risks that it will face are to do with the type of crypto it uses. If it's using very cutting-edge crypto, again, you know, even if they've solved largely the feature requirements of you know, getting the, the, efficient, the computational and space efficiency, I mean, as, as long as the um, verification efficiency is reasonable, the creation efficiency, you know, we can play with that somewhat. It doesn't matter so much if that's somewhat computationally expensive or memory intensive or what have you. In that circumstance, the problem is that if it's involving experimental cryptography, you run the risk that if you say, OK, let's adopt this for Bitcoin, uh, you know, if somebody makes some new group theory attack or some mathematical attack in the, uh, over the next five to ten years, it could be a currency catastrophe of uh, like economic global scale. Right. So we At least we can somewhat trust the uh, ECDSA to be thoroughly tested and rely right. on it for decades. Right. I mean, so in fact, it's a curious fact, uh, artifact that Bitcoin itself is using only very simple conservative cryptography. And actually, I had some thoughts about the fungibility layer. So hypothetically, if we had uh, the desirable fungibility layer, so if we had, uh, let's say, ZeroCoin2, their papers say it has ideal properties and... And let's say there's a zero coin three, rather, which uh, by the John Hopkins authors or by any other author. So uh, a cryptographically perfect fungibility layer, which would hide who's paying who, how much, and avoid any anonymity set limitations. So you have a full anonymity set between all the holders of uh, Bitcoin. Now, in that circumstance, uh, you have a quite extreme form of anonymity, anonymous payment. You know, one person can pay another person one cent or a billion dollars, and there's nothing anybody can do about it ever to determine what just happened. You, know, you can't trace can't it. Can't see it, can't stop it, no. can't trace it. I mean, and you can say that, I mean, there, there may be some limits to that, which is it would typically be the case with any anonymity protocol that the sender would keep a transcript or could keep a transcript, and so the sender may be able to retain a proof that he could reveal in case of subpoena to show who he sent it to. And so there could be some limited traceability, but I think it's entirely possible also to build different uh, privacy features. So if you view the fungibility layer as about fungibility purely, which is to say that that enforces that a dollar is a dollar and you don't get any red listing or taint tracking attacks that affect transaction costs into the fungibility layer. Above that, we have a payment layer, and already we have the Bitcoin payment protocol with sort of identification for the web server, that, so you know you're paying the right person. So I think the correct place to manage identity is in the payment protocol layer and to keep the transaction layer uh, pure to avoid transaction cost leakage. Now, you can add or manage all kinds of different um, privacy layers and you have a lot of flexibility and it's all using standard, very simple cryptography at that layer once you have the perfect cryptographic fungibility layer. So, for example, you can use the existing uh, Bitcoin sort of self-chosen account number, pseudonym model where you have an address that your computer has generated. You could choose to reuse that address and actually contrary to uh, de facto advice many Bitcoin clients, many Bitcoin wallets reuse addresses, which actually damages the fungibility layer as present. But with perfect fungibility, you could reuse the address just for convenience. And what that would mean is that, you know, if you paid one person, you paid another person, you'd have a similar kind of linkability that you have in the Bitcoin protocol at present, uh, which could be visible or could be encrypted between the users if, it, if that's arranged so that a user could be presented, you know, so a business entity with business records could be presented with a subpoena to say, to prove the account numbers that it had transacted with if somebody was trying to trace some funds for some kind of crime-related event. In your interactions with regulated businesses, you could provide identity. So, for example, the analogy of going into a gun shop uh, with a passport, proving you're eligible to own a gun in the United States, handing over cash over the counter to buy, pay for the gun. There's no identity attached to the cash. The identity is attached to the transaction. You right. show the passport. And so you see the same thing. You could do that with a regulated business using Bitcoin. So actually, that was my objection to the red listing train of thinking is that you don't want to extract that from the fungibility layer because you damage the fungibility layer. If you do want to provide 
a facility to help people run regulated businesses. You provide some mechanism for a digital driver's license that smooths the path to signing up to exchanges where currently you have to fax them high resolution or not fax scan and send them high resolution scans of your you know, utility bills and passport and what have you. You could have an electronic version of that that's validated by a registration authority in the same way that you have certificates issued by a certification authority and a registration authority that verifies the underlying documents and proofs. Yeah, the idea that uh, that somehow the only way to solve crime is to track everybody's money all the time is insidious. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are, crime was solved before money was trackable, and trackable money is a recent invention. Somehow people managed to solve crime when, when a lot of transactions were entirely in cash, and we didn't need every bill tracked. So right. it, it's really a new invention, right? Yes, very much so. Actually, can we stop it in well, Bitcoin? Can we provide a fix that will solve this problem at a protocol layer before it becomes implemented by governments? I mean, we have a number of best effort technologies, and there are things we can do to improve the fungibility layer within the scope of Bitcoin itself, I mean, with existing protocols. So encourage more Bitcoin wallets to not reuse addresses. As I understand it, the religious pool is discouraging reuse addresses by prioritizing single-use addresses, prioritizing the processing of single-use addresses. Oh, wow. And there is a protocol by Greg Maxwell called CoinJoin, which provides a kind of trustless way to improve fungibility. So basically, you know, there's, there's some kind of traceability in the Bitcoin network to do with change addresses and so on. And the CoinJoin protocol, which can be implemented in a server, and I understand uh, blockchain.info has done that, and maybe some other actors can also be implemented in the client, which I think is an even more interesting place to put it, can basically slightly enhance the existing fungibility mechanism. And I think people should understand that this is not necessarily about achieving anonymity. It's about retaining the value in Bitcoin. Bitcoin's value, in part, in a large part, I suspect, depends on the fungibility of the coin, because otherwise the transaction costs rise to each credit card, and then it no longer has a transactional advantage. So I think it's in the interest of every significant holder of Bitcoin to ensure that we draw a line in the sand and don't encourage or condone or make use of any systems which try to encourage red listing and therefore damage fungibility. So I view CoinJoin as a, as a good, practical, immediate step that can be taken. And you see that also the dark wallet with Amir Taki and Vitalik Buterin and some other participants. They're implementing peer-to-peer -peer mediated coin join within the dark wallet client. So that will basically become the wallet that most strongly strengthens fungibility, which is important mm -hmm. for Bitcoin. So once they get that implemented, I would encourage other users to look at their innovation in terms of the peer-to-peer -peer mechanism that they will have to develop to achieve that. One um, of the things we've learned about practical application of cryptography tools and privacy tools for a broad audience was that things that require technical expertise and power users like PGP email never achieves mass scale. But things that were on by default, always on, and in many cases without the user's choice, like SSL, have been much more effective at bringing mass adoption of these uh, capabilities. Do you see the same issue with point join? Do we really need to make this the default selection for every wallet so the user is doing coin remixing, whether they know it or not, and every transaction is, is coin joined? Yes, I mean, I think until we have a stronger cryptographic solution that doesn't rely on potentially risky cutting-edge crypto, that's the best we have. And I mean, I don't really like to call it mixing because I, I don't really view it about anonymity. I view it about fungibility. You know, they're, mm -hmm. still, they're still tracking outside of that in terms of people are interacting with websites at the payment level. So there's still trackability at the payment level, at the TCP IP level. TCP IP addresses are connectable to physical addresses. Or even by, you can look up geolocation, but ISPs retain logs. So there's very much trackability and identity involved in you know 99% of Bitcoin users who are not bad actors, existing Bitcoin payment processors, merchants, and so on. So really, it's not about mixing, which is a kind of anonymity term, but it's about a fungibility mechanism to cryptographically enforce fungibility with this kind of, um, it is mixing technically at a technical level, but it's, it's about retaining fungibility. Yeah, so fungibility is, is one of the core principles that make, gives Bitcoin its strength. Right. We should not give up that capability. And if we do so, and if we fail to recognize the signs that some of these perhaps misguided but well-meaning attempts to prevent fraud by modifying the fungibility of the protocol can ultimately have very destructive consequences 
on the value of the currency by essentially PayPalizing it or turning it into a credit card equivalent. Right. So I mean, I think uh, any kind of um, identity management should happen at the payment level, and we've already got steps towards that with the payment protocol that Mike Hearn proposed. Um, uh, there's a BIP. It's it's being implemented. BIP 70, BIP 71 for the payment protocol. Yeah. Right. And actually, the payment protocol itself provides a new privacy feature independent from CoinJoin, which can be used in conjunction with it, which is that one of the things that links transactions is the transaction amount. If, co- if addresses are not reduced, the, the main thing that leaks it is the transaction amount and the change address, if the transaction amount is unique. And so one thing you can do within the payment protocol is you can uh, request multiple addresses from the merchant. So, you know, if you're paying 10.95 for something, you can pay $5 and $5 and build it up out of change that has more even values. So that makes it stand out less in terms of looking at the Bitcoin transaction network, which is the change address, and whether these two payments, the two $5 payments, are actually involving the same user and the same merchant. If it's done properly, that may not be so obvious. So you don't need to combine uh, many of your smaller inputs, thereby tainting them with each other, which would also reveal prior relationships between them. So there's there's another layer to that. That's very interesting. I mean, at at present, the... uh, Bitcoin wallets are not doing anything intelligent in terms of their change management. So there's a feature called Coin Control, which aims to make more intelligent use of change to sort of try to minimize the number of change values within your wallet because it's pretty much when you combine values. So, you know, if you've got like 110 cents left over as you have your jar of change at home, if you start using that in Bitcoin terms, that's what tends to link your payments together. I wanted to say something else um, about the tendency to think that it's necessary to put innovation into altcoins. So I went through an evolution of thinking about this uh, when I first really got deeply involved in understanding the Bitcoin limitations and trying to help move them forward uh, sort of about six months ago, early this year. I thought that the proposals could be potentially integrated into Bitcoin, but over time I realized that the Bitcoin core developers have a this challenge we discussed earlier that they can't accept high-risk trans- changes because they've got to be so careful about testing. And so, so then you start to think, well, maybe you could put this in one of the altcoins. But to do that presents a new risk to Bitcoin, which I think potentially the world can only really support one virtual scarce currency because you know, if one of the altcoins were hypothetically to reach parity with Bitcoin, firstly, that is has no intrinsic value, which is a kind of dangerous position itself, but if psychologically people jumped onto it, I say no intrinsic, fa- no intrinsic value because there's no transaction load in there. If hypothetically people were to, Bitcoin holders, the speculative component of Bitcoin's value, were to jump into this altcoin, you might see some, like a, a Bitcoin price collapse and the altcoin taking off. And then once, and then maybe uh, actual transactions moving to the network or transactions happening via Bitcoin, sort of currency conversion from the alt to Bitcoin to the merchant, because Bitcoin also has all the infrastructure. But the, once you have this kind of unhealthy situation, you might see holders of this new altcoin looking nervously over their shoulder at the next altcoin, which was in a similar position, no, no intrinsic value, but it's gaining a value on it speculatively. And basically, once people were to experience this kind of thing, it might say, well, wait a minute, what does virtual scarcity mean? If everybody can come along and propose some kind of parameter tweak or small functional change to get users' interest or even the name or affiliation with a celebrity or something Mm -hmm. silly like that, uh, people might start to question the very core principle of virtual scarce commodity. So I think it's really best to focus on and stick with the one bootstrapped currency. And I I don't think it's really... um, a fair proposition to go into an altcoin because now that it's happened once, people are looking at it as something that is much more plausible. Stating my dislike for that, I mean, there's a, there's a financial risk there for the Bitcoin stability and long-term viability of digital scarcity, which I think is, you know, I think digital scarcity is a huge invention for Sarsi that basically Satoshi enabled with this new innovation of uh, controlled supply. I think it'd be a very unfortunate end for Bitcoin if that were to collapse or, or be significantly weakened by a kind of speculative bubbles in altcoins that were to start to compete with Bitcoin for market cap. So having stated that reservation, what do I propose to that people could do about that? And what I propose is that they could put it in Bitcoin. So we know that's challenging, but I proposed a way to put new features into Bitcoin without risking Bitcoin value. And basically the way you do that is you start a new altcoin We'll call it Bitcoin 2. So Bitcoin is currently on version 0.89 something. So as with operating systems and other software packages, 
it's quite common for there to be a beta version. But it's not an alpha version. It's relatively stable. It's not going to eat your data, lose your files, corrupt your computer. So you put the features into the beta version, and there's development in parallel. You know, people are maintaining bug fixes, as in Bitcoin, on the current stable version, and they're adding the missing features to the beta version. And you could view it as the, as the way you see with Red Hat and Fedora. Red Hat is extremely well tested, and enterprises can rely on it for rock steady service for important websites. Fedora is adding new features all the time. Periodically, there will be a new major release of Red Hat, which pulls in the features from Fedora, stabilizes it, and uses it. So what I would like to see for Bitcoin is for Bitcoin to adopt this development model. And so because it's a currency, there's a question of, can you put value in the, in the Fedora of Bitcoin, in the Bitcoin 2? And it turns out there is a way to do that while avoiding importing risk back into the main Bitcoin network. And what you, what you can do is have a, a mathematical one-way peg between Bitcoin and Bitcoin 2, which is to say you're allowed to move an existing Bitcoin into the Bitcoin 2 network. But the Bitcoin 2 network has no native reward mining. It would probably be merge mined with Bitcoin. And by doing this, there would be a market price to move the coins back. And by doing it this way, you preserve the 21 million coin promise, like that cap is maintained through the evolution of features and through the move between major new features. So you could imagine sort of a timeline of, say, one year or 18 months or whatever cycle makes sense for testing resources available to move between these things. And, you know, as it gets closer to the switch over time, people would move coins over and you could algorithmically move the remaining coins over and then start the process again and move forward in that way. So, and it, and it, so it's it, not so just it's, about uh, how you implement the technology, it's also how you implement the currency infrastructure and the balance between main coin, altcoin, or in this case main coin and dev coin essentially that's happened, the development coin or, or beta coin that's happening right. to I promote mean, these new features. I mean basically it's a rejection of the idea that you should push innovation into altcoins because I view that as an existential risk to the right. very concept of digital scarcity as well as being, I don't know, pure speculation. And, and I mean, it also detracts from the Bitcoin uh, mindshare and the basic model. And the interesting thing about having a one-way peg is you can't introduce a two-way peg because while you're being very careful on the Bitcoin 2, you are adding new features. If something bad happens, despite the best efforts, you don't want that risk being imported into Bitcoin. Right. So because there's a Volve or one-way peg, if you want to go back into Bitcoin, you have to buy it at market. And if, if a vulnerability is discovered, until that's fixed, that market will freeze up. So there'll be no yeah. risk to Bitcoin. The price will diverge, essentially. Temporarily, yeah, until, temporarily. until the issue is fixed, unless, unless it's a, yeah. And that provides enough friction to, to keep people in Bitcoin too, allowing you the, the fix to happen so that you can then recover that. Right, yes. And, and I think people, so, I mean, one, one worry people might have is to say that, well, the technical mechanism by which you move Bitcoins into the Bitcoin 2 is technically you destroy the Bitcoin. And so they view that as somehow uh, aesthetically unpleasing that you've destroyed this beautiful rare number or something. But actually, it's just a technical mechanism to move a coin. So you can still verify that this is a, a mined coin when it's been moved into the other network. You look with a reference of where it came from when you look at the mining event. So, and as long as people can see a promise and timeline that the Bitcoin 2 network will become the Bitcoin network within some approximate timeline. They shouldn't have too much reservation about putting money into it. Now, you could see in the short term that, you know, if somebody needs to move money back or prefers to move money back after they've used the features in Bitcoin 2 for long-time storage into the original Bitcoin network, that there might be a mismatch between the market. So anybody who wants to move Bitcoins into Bitcoin 2 can do it by destroying a coin. So they will, there's no loss to them to accept a trade coming back the other way. But there's a, if there's a trade imbalance in the other direction, the coins could potentially sell below par. But I think if, if there's an implied promise that it doesn't really matter, you know, if, if you just wait, wait another six months or something, all the coins are going to be equivalent because they're all going to move into, you know, the Bitcoin's going to move on to the next version anyway, then it should combat any kind of extreme fluctuations. And if there are fluctuations with that implied promise there, if there's a significant discount, people will buy them to hold them for the year, basically, because it'll be an arbitrage opportunity with a quite certain payout. I mean, there's no counterparty risk. It's the ultimate merge of, of open source as a development model and currencies, and, right. and there's some real intricacies in the management of that. So I just wanted to explore another 
payment privacy model, which is, so one thing that you see in Bitcoin is that all the transaction values are public on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And um, that creates a risk for analysis of the values in order to break the, the, the privacy and Well, uh, I mean, so that's very much true. So, but there's, there's another motivation, which is apart from like taint analysis, which is actually more to do with the chain of custody, which is visible, but also the transaction amounts provide a, a second attack on that. But there's, a, there's another layer, so like more at the business layer or something, that looking at the values flowing on the network, you know, you have to be careful using Bitcoin that you don't reveal your Bitcoin net worth by making a small payment from a large denomination coin. So, you know, if you're holding a lot of coins, maybe you want to divide them up into small pieces so that you don't get risk getting mugged if you pay somebody, mm -hmm. you know, one Bitcoin and they can see. Uh, I saw somebody last week who had 500 Bitcoins on his phone, which... I think is an insane risk, personally, knowing, <laughs> knowing quite a lot about host security and other factors. You know, the baseband processor on the phone is actually quite easy to hack. And once you have control of the baseband processor, hack over the air, the baseband processor is the part that implements the uh, GSM protocol. And once you have control of the GSM, you know, the baseband processor, you have root access to the application processor and can empty it of Bitcoins, basically. So don't do that. <laughs> yeah. There's the concern about, so net worth analysis and... Some people are paid their salaries in Bitcoin, so they reveal their, you know, people can go look how much they earn. So kind of violation of uh, payment privacy. And people wouldn't be comfortable if their credit card statement was posted online in the same way. And it's basically what Bitcoin does. And also for companies, it's quite uh, unattractive because you know, any kind of Bitcoin ecosystem company has to be careful that their business model can't be reverse engineered by looking at their profit margins, looking at their trade volume. It's all on the blockchain. It can be explored. People can get an idea of which address is theirs just by using their service. Right. Even if they reuse addresses, there's some linkability. Some want open book accounting, but this is open book accounting for everyone, whether they want it or not. Right, so going back to some early cypherpunk ideas, Eric Hughes had uh, proposed the idea of an encrypted open book. So it turns out that some of the encryption algorithms provide homomorphic additions. So now it's relatively well known that dual homomorphic encryption where it, it supports addition and multiplication is a kind of open problem there finally in the last decade have been a system that works but is phenomenally impractically expensive but in the realm of single homomorphic encryption where you can do addition only or multiplication only or some variant of that. There are actually very efficient systems to do that. And so, so just a quick explanation, homomorphic encryption, the ability to do addition, this is where you get two encrypted inputs, you compute the output, and you, don't, you have no idea what you just computed, but the output can be valid and used by someone. Right, exactly. So if you have, let's say, $2 plus $5 getting combined and spent to a $7 payment, if you have encrypted two dollars, encrypted five dollars, you can you can actually test that that adds up to encrypted seven dollars, without knowing any of the amounts involved. So you can use this principle on the blockchain. So if you have encrypted values instead of the current 64-bit plain text values, you have encrypted values, and you can have validation with value of privacy. So right. it's very attractive for practical commercial use of Bitcoin because co companies very much don't want to expose their profit margins and so forth. Um, now, there's a technical problem with straightforward homomorphic encryption. Otherwise, it would actually be very efficient, space efficient. So the, the base thing is you just need to, you can store that in about the size of a DSA signature or something of that order, which is very space efficient and quite practical. But there's a, there's a problem, which is that the homomorphic encryption, the addition operation is actually modulo the order of the group, which is a very large number n. And because of that, you can cheat and you can add n to your balance by doing various things. So you have to defend against that, and that adds some complexity. But there are conservative known crypto approaches to proving that it didn't wrap around. So it's basically called a zero-knowledge range proof. So I spent quite a bit of time a few months ago optimizing zero-knowledge range proofs to enable uh, encrypted values, and I was able to get it down to about a kilobyte per value, because that's still quite a bit bigger than uh, eight bytes plain text values, but for high value commercial transactions. It's worth the extra cost. Yeah, I mean, it's, yep. it's a negligible cost if you're talking about, you know, $100,000 transaction or a million dollar transaction or something where you need that kind of thing. So we could see a mixture of, and actually they are compatible. You can mix homomorphic values and plain text values. So the validation procedure can take unencrypted inputs and 
combine that and check that it adds up to an unencrypted output. Then you would be able to move money around on the network and not really be able to see what's going on. And there's an additional kind of curiosity, which is I found that I could make an extended zero-knowledge proof, which created a kind of extended version of CoinJoin. So with CoinJoin, you need to collect people to participate with you voluntarily to improve the fungibility. So there's a, there's a signature concept called a, a ring signature, and CoinJoin is more like a multi-party signature where a group of people get together and they sign a message together. A ring signature is that I personally want to sign a signature, but I want to make it ambiguous who authored this message. And so I can implicate, uh, without any cooperation or agreement, other people as potential authors of it using a ring, ring signature. So using uh, the zero-knowledge proof proofs and homomorphic encrypted value constructs together, I, could, I made something I called uh, ring coin. And the way that works is that you can basically prove that of the inputs to this transaction, some of them are mine because I know the private key, and some of them are other people's. And the way that I'm able to claim other people's, that I'm able to modify other people's uh, balances, apparently, apparent balances, is that I can prove that either I know that coin's private key, so I'm authorized to take value off it, or that the amount I'm taking off it is an encrypted version of zero. So that's of no possible damage to anybody for the network to allow me to take zero off of hundreds of other people. And so that, that could potentially provide a uh, more robust fungibility. And unfortunately, the uh, zero-knowledge proof doubles in size from one kilobyte to two kilobytes where you do that because the way you do zero-knowledge or proofs, there's a kind of basic fundamental building block, involves basically doing things twice. You have to mm -hmm. have, cover both halves of it. So it basically doubles the zero-knowledge proof size. But I, I was quite interested to explore whether there was some way to make an even more compact ring proof where you could basically have an anonymity set from a large number of coins chosen at random or chosen specifically. So it can be, it can, I mean, the a potential limitation with coin join is that people could uh, try to influence the parties that you are joining with to reduce your anonymity set and therefore the effectiveness of the fungibility improvement. So being able to choose... And the values are visible. And which, the values are visible. Right. right. <laughs> which is a big uh, a taint in traffic analysis, right? Right. So it, it might be within the bounds of possibility that one could get a ring signature even with Bitcoin using some kind of extended coin join. I haven't thought too much about that, but it's, it's an interesting thing to consider further. But certainly with the um, ability to choose who you're mixing, so to choose an anonymously yourself is much more certain that nobody is attacking your network sense to influence who you're joining with. So if, if your adversary is all the people you're joining with, you've, you haven't enhanced fungibility at all, in fact. So if you can choose them at random, like with a cryptographic random number generator, you're much more confident that you've achieved some real fungibility improvement. And alternatively, you, you could even selectively choose the people to be plausible individuals who might otherwise have executed this transaction. So, you know, for example, if it's uh, an exchange transaction, you might mix it with other users of that same exchange or something like that. So you, you could perhaps get even more practical uh, fungibility improvement by carefully choosing people that you mix with. So, so it sounds like we're, we're still at the very early stages. I mean, Bitcoin has proven its capability to survive as a currency and generates a lot of value for a lot of people. But there's so much more we can do within the protocol. You've mentioned four different approaches to improving the fungibility layer and creating anonymity and privacy within Clearly, the state of the art is progressing just as fast in this new theoretical developments as uh, Bitcoin is progressing itself. Yeah, I mean, I think the important thing is to um, use conservative cryptography, or if you're using experimental cryptography, to have a disaster recovery plan that doesn't result in loss of funds. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there's some scope within that. We do need to improve the fungibility layer if we possibly can. The coin join and uh, possibly ring coin. Another thing I had discussed with... Um, Greg Maxwell and others was to use a different signature algorithm. So the ECDSA algorithm is a slightly complicated version of the Schnorr algorithm. So I believe the main reason that ECDSA even came into existence was to work around the Schnorr pattern, which has now expired. But the Schnorr algorithm is uh, very much simpler and actually slightly more secure, more efficient, and very much more flexible. So you can do blind signatures with it. You can do signatures from a trusted hardware device like a Trezor while blocking any subliminal channel 
There's a problem with the hardware devices. You may not trust the hardware manufacturer. And he has the easy possibility with a DSA signature to hide information in the K value and therefore leak the private key mm -hmm. and steal your funds or trace you or what have you. So using a Schnorr signature... So like a deliberate uh, example of what we saw with the Android bug where the K value wasn't uh, right. sufficiently random, but in this case you're deliberately introducing a, a compromised K. Right. Well, actually, I mean, there's, there's two things. So uh, what you mentioned about the Android device is um, a misuse or, or not following advice. Basically, people should be using deterministic DSA, which derives the K value deterministically from the message. And the ECDSA private key is, is a well-known protocol, and all Bitcoin clients should be using it as soon as possible. And that obviates the ongoing dependence on a random number generator. You only need random number generation during the initial setup of your wallet to create this, the ECDSA private key. So people should be doing that, and that would have avoided the Android problem. And if you can take random number generators during the initial stage only, you know, you can have manual user entropy input. They can type on the keyboard, move the mouse, or what have you, speak into the microphone or Android phone. So that, that's the way to attack, to tackle that problem. Now, in terms of the subliminal channel, it's... It's exactly as you said, that somebody could, a malicious hardware vendor could extract a private key and leak it. He has a subliminal channel over the message that the user is sending. And so any, any kind of offline client, and the, and the only two ones we have that I'm aware of right now are Armory Offline Client and the Trezor Hardware Wallet. So using the elliptic curve Schnorr algorithm, there's a protocol which is, I'm not sure if it's actually due to Brands, it may actually be earlier, but it was certainly used to good effect by Stefan Brands in his protocols. So his electronic hash protocols have what he calls a wallet and observer protocol, where you can have a subliminal channel free way to get a signature from an embedded device. And so basically the way it works is you blind the message that you want the device to sign, and you provide a zero-knowledge proof that the message inside the blinded message is this clear text message. The device shows the clear text message, gets the user approval, signs it, sends it back to the host computer, and the host computer can then unblind it, securing the knowledge that unless this hostile device has like a hidden Wi-Fi card in it or something, there's no way, it has no communication path to the network. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a more secure way of doing things. And also, uh, Schnorr signatures have other advantages uh, in that they are easy to make compact multi-signatures. So with, with Bitcoin multi-sigs, you have a separate signature for each signer which takes up space on the blockchain. So if you have two or three signers, you have to have slots for those two signatures to go. With a Schnorr signature, you can have a, a direct multi-party signature by two parties, and the final signature is of size of one signature, and the public key of the signature is the addition of the two signers' public keys. And it also supports simply K of N threshold signatures, you know, so you okay. can have two of three and so on in the same model where the final signature is compact. I think potentially even with no prior setup, so the users don't have to be part of a cooperative. You know, you and I, if we'd never met before, we could get together and sign a two of two signature, involving our pre-existing public keys with uh, value on them. So that's the Schnorr signature, um, and some of, some of these features can have potential to uh, save space on the blockchain, which is a valuable resource, and potentially to improve the fungibility mechanisms. So, for example, Greg Maxwell had mentioned that he had some thoughts about using this kind of signature to make CoinJoin more effective um, because there is some visibility of what's going on based on who's signing. Uh, so I think I, I didn't fully understand where he thought that could go, but maybe he, had, he can figure something out. So there's, there's certainly a lot more flexibility and a lot more possibilities from it. It's more efficient, more secure, and Dan Bernstein has proposed Schnorr signatures in a new standard called EDDSA, and I think it's useful and possible that the Bitcoin network could add that, add that protocol even incrementally, and actually they have been considering it for independent reasons. It's more efficient as well. So this essentially means not necessarily replacing ECDSA, but allowing people the possibility of using multiple different right. uh, signature algorithms for the protection of their outputs. The EC Schnorr algorithm is um, more efficient uh, computationally and can be much more efficient space-wise in terms of blockchain bandwidth usage if uh, multi-signatures start to become widely used. And I think for many of the more interesting longer-term features involving smart contracts and so on, uh, multi-signatures are more commonly used, so that, that could provide some value there. Mm -hmm.
All right, my guest has been Adam Beck, applied cryptographer and very influential both in the early history of digital cash, but now increasingly helping us make Bitcoin better and applying his cryptographic skills to improving the core fundamentals, including the fungibility layers we discussed. Adam, thank you very much for joining our show. You're very welcome. Bitcoin with Adam Back was recorded and produced by Andreas M. Antonopoulos. Edited by Matthew Zipkin, with additional editing by Adam B. Levine. It featured Adam Back and Andreas M. Antonopoulos. Music for this episode was provided by Jared Rubens, Calvin Henderson, and Matthew Murkowski. Questions or comments? Email adam at letstalkbitcoin.com. Have a good one.